uh, yeah, that was really great. I'm, it's Robert Bernstein with Ketchum. Um, on the value of the viral lift. Yeah. So, do you have have you been able to track some kind of just for example on a product or a sales figures where the 1.3 viral lift versus the same amount paid but not shared and to show some kind of difference in the actual transformation into uh, revenue? Yeah, so I think there is a lot of research we still need to do about that, and I think it depends on why there's viral lift. So if there's viral lift because you made a campaign that's really entertaining, but it doesn't relate to your strategy at all, um, then, then you don't really get much, much business benefit from the viral lift, right? So, so if you are, you know, make some crazy dancing bear that's doing flips and everyone loves it, and they don't realize that what you're trying to sell is, you know, is, uh, you know, Volkswagen or something, then you're not going to get any benefit. But if you make someone driving a really cool looking Volkswagen and doing some cool chick tricks with it or doing something interesting that relates to the product and then people share it, um, then you, you, we, we found you usually do. And we have done brand studies with advertisers where they want to know, um, you know, do, we, we, they're excited to see the viral lift, but they also want to see how it affects um, people's perception of the brand. And we've, we have found a, a lift in those kinds of branding metrics as well. Um, the, the question about sales, um, I think um, narrow, so, so I think in some ways viral is like the flip side of the direct response um, s um, model where you're trying to sell in, in the sense that um, you can, we, you know, we have had campaigns where people have been able to convert a lot of people, but, but when you're trying to sell, sometimes the easiest thing to do is create a funnel and simplify everything and don't let them do anything else and don't distract them and just get them to that buy button. Um, and when you're, trying to, when you're trying to make something go viral, you're often showing them, share this with your friends, pass this on, who, does this, who, should, who else should see this video, you know, and you're getting them to, to spread, spread it. And that actually is great for brand awareness and brand, um, you know, um, all the brand values, which are also measurable, um, but isn't necessarily the best way to get someone to like click through and buy. So I think that um, viral is like a powerful tool. <clears throat> it's not the only tool. Um, and, um, and you can get real business benefit from, from the viral lift if you use it in the right way. Cool, okay. So I guess I'll just jump into my part and then we'll have plenty of time actually brought in up to whatever people want to talk about. Uh, so uh, my talk today actually is going to slice this topic in a slightly different direction uh, to actually talk about sort of the economics of all this data. Uh, and specifically its interface with advertising on one hand and web culture on the other and essentially how the interface between all those things might have an impact on sort of the vibrancy of sites uh, and communities online. And so the thinking starts um, in thinking about the common kind of economic lifeblood that sort of courses through everything from sort of the largest uh, information providers online to kind of the most sort of mimetic primordial soups of the web uh, to even sort of individual producers, right, in the form of, you know, someone like uh, the Gregory Brothers. Um, and the little talked about and little referenced fact of all those things is despite sort of massive innovations in the last decade or so, what's often understated is the extent to which kind of plain old boring advertising is still uh, sort of the basic financial basis uh, of a lot of the most exciting kind of cultural spaces online. Um, so as a result, any discussion of popular web culture inherently implicates uh, a discussion around advertising and the economics uh, of advertising. And to that end, culture online takes place on a backdrop of a much larger trend, right? Which is uh, that in some ways you could actually argue that the bottom is dropping out of online advertising in a lot of ways. You've seen click-throughs uh, decline consistently ever since the 90s. Uh, people report year after year in increasing numbers that they don't pay attention to any ads whatsoever. Um, and we should actually be concerned about this, right? Because if it's in fact sort of the financial engine that keeps a lot of these spaces running, uh, then what happens to that economy actually has a lot of effect on sort of the culture uh, of the web. Um, and so there's this natural question of sort of what to do, right? And one uh, easy approach that a lot of people have taken, which is a very natural approach, is to say, okay, well, we've got these visitors who are visiting our site, uh, and we're collecting a little bit of data about them, and that allows us to target them just slightly. 
But only if we're able to collect more data, if we're able to extract and harvest more information about our users, we may be able to kind of get the yield from advertising up again, right? We might be able to figure out that they really like boats, or they've really been into uh, this person recently and you need to buy them, or suggest that they buy a gift or take someone out on a date. And so the approach is actually to increase kind of data yield. And you can use that to characterize a lot of things that happened on social platforms uh, in the last five years, right? You can um, add more features that allows you to collect more information about your users. You can make your platform more ubiquitous, right? Facebook's now on Yelp. Uh, or you can sort of interface with other social platforms in an effort to collect uh, this amount of information. But there's two kind of big fundamental problems uh, with this strategy that has really kind of motivated a lot of efforts in social platforms. One of them, of course, is that there's sort of limited and declining value in the information you collect about people, right? So it's very useful to know demographics about someone, uh, but maybe less useful um, the more information you gather around them, right? So you sort of have declining value to what you get to gather. Um, and after a certain point, it can actually get quite expensive to get that information, even though it's not actually of much use. Uh, the second one, and a tied one, is something that I've been kind of affectionately been calling the creepy factor. And the creepy factor is best explained by the creep to data curve. Right? And the, the creep to data curve is very simple. The idea is you collect more and more data about a user and it gets creepier and creepier and creepier until at some point you're able to make really great recommendations about what they want to see and the creepiness just declines almost to zero. Now, and you, you, can, you can structure sites along this continuum, right? Because the essential argument here is that the difference between a really great recommendation engine and really creepy advertising is actually just a matter of degree. So Pandora, for example, would fall very far on the right end of the list to the extent where it's actually almost not considered advertising anymore. Um, and sort of Gmail reading your email is probably more to the left of this. And now we'd like to think that the kind of creepy threshold at which people start to feel uncomfortable is a little bit after that point at which you can start making really great recommendations, right? Um, and that we'd be able to continue collecting information until we get to that point. Um, but often that's really not the case, right? That creepy threshold is usually a little bit before and, and often quite a bit before that point. Um, and the problem is the collection of increased amounts of data actually has corrosive effects on the effect of a community, right? Because it's highly invasive, people feel uncomfortable about it. Uh, and so there's this kind of fundamental problem to the collection of data. And this leads to something that I've been thinking about recently that I like to call peak data. Um, and it's where these two problems converge. On one hand, there's more and more costs and energy going into gathering information about users. Um, and that increasingly outweighs the value that people are getting out of it. And then increasingly, it kind of pushes against that creepy threshold, right? Uh, and, and advertising actually plays a role in, in destroying communities or making communities uh, less effective or less organic than they would otherwise be. Um, and there's sort of huge impact to this, right? On one hand, um, as advertising desires more and more data about users, there's this implication that it may become more and more uh, negative uh, to communities. And the second one is that if yield gets lower and lower, right, click-through rates get lower and lower and everything else, um, then the raw amount of money on advertising declines, right? And if it becomes sort of less and less effective over time, there's this worry about its impact on the social platforms that it supports, right? So how do we avoid this, right? How do we avoid essentially the data effect of strip mining? <laughs> Um, and I think this goes back to uh, something, and the use of peak data here is intentional, right? The, the comparison to the fuel crisis is intentional, because I think there's a really good parallel. Our approach so far has been to collect more and more data, right? It's essentially about the increase of raw materials. But at least in the advertising space, that's only part of the picture, right? You need to do something to that data in order to make it effective, something that you can actually use uh, to target. Um, and presently, our tools for doing that refiner are actually pretty crude, right? People focus on page views or how many times my brand was mentioned. And the focus has ultimately been gaining uh, on increasing the amount of data, right? Making the intrusion ever greater. And there's a parallel to the fuel thing, right? Because raw fuel needs to be processed in order to produce energy. Um, and so the approach here is, well, we know fuel is extremely limited, so what we really need to work on uh, is this technology, this refining technology, right? To get more yield out of what we can gather. And so I think there's actually a parallel approach where instead of trying to gather more data about users, we take what we currently have and try to use it more effectively, right? And which leads to this kind of metaphor of a sort of, sort of social data green tech, um, if you will. Um, and basically that says we're already gathering really amazing things about our users, so the big question is what do we do with it? And the hope actually here is that there's a big promise in avoiding the corrosive effect of advertising because you might be able to push that creepy curve more and more to the left, right? So you start to be able to make greater recommendations before people even start feeling uh, uncomfortable. 
And so what's that clean tech look like? And so there, there's a number of incidents, and I think this is still kind of an emerging idea. Um, but one of them, of course, is BuzzFeed, right? Like uh, some of the stuff that you've seen is, is sort of great kind of, yeah, that's an awesome caption, by the way. <laughs> Um, is, is a great kind of breakdown, right? Even thinking about things in terms of viral lift and uh, sort of seed impressions is like a really important kind of comparison to be made. Um, we, we might also get a little bit more nuanced about what we mean by social churn, right? So right now everybody's like, well, we have these social monitoring tools that tell us how many times our brand is mentioned, but the types of mentions uh, actually have different types of values. So this is uh, a little visualization that was came up with uh, uh, a research group that I work with called the Web Ecology Project. And essentially what they do, what we did was um, we took kind of 10 popular Twitterers and the white spark lines essentially are times that they put out pieces of content. And then each of the colors refers to things that their followers did, right? Did they just repeat the content? Did they mention it? Did they reply? So on and so forth. And you actually can see that various places are able to generate very distinctive burst patterns um, in, their, in their release of content. And that has implications for what you might want to do um, from an advertising point of view. Finally, obviously, there's a lot of work that's been done in social network analysis around the kinds of ways you could break down the structure of people participating online uh, in a way that actually makes things more effective. And beyond also the clear business implications of this, there might be a really important thing from the point of view of the fact that since advertising doesn't look like it's going anywhere anytime soon, there's this importance in attempting to find a way uh, to make it fit properly into facilitating sort of vibrant cultural activity online. And so the big question is actually one of uh, conservation. Um, so that's actually what I've been uh, thinking a lot about recently. Um, and uh, I guess without further ado, we'll just move to, uh, move to a discussion. So. Any questions, thoughts on this? Or, or either, either of what we've talked about? I have a question for you. Oh, shoot. So I love that uh, idea of, of trying to move the, 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 the port place where you can make useful recommendations um, um, in front of the creepiest, creepiness line. Um, but is that idea itself creepy? Like if, you, <laughs> if, you know, if, you're, if you're able to take, you know, like one of the things that I think is interesting going on right now with in, in sort of machine learning is that it might be that we only know three or four things about a person, but those things are highly correlated with all this other information. So like we have like a 97% chance of knowing like all kinds of personal intimate things about you. Mm -hmm. And so then you can make really good recommendations, but um, without really knowing that much, which is awesome, um, but it almost is like uh, more awesome if you're the person doing it than if you're, I, I don't know. Like, I can it, see that, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, essentially, yeah, and I, and I can see that, right? Like, um, I guess th this goes to what was brought up in the last panel, right, about like, uh, if, if a brand does, it really does its homework on you and meets you at the airport with something that you really <laughs> wanted to buy, um, that's a little bit creepy, <laughs> right? Um, I, I think, yeah, there's definitely that element there. Um, I guess I wonder, I guess I would rather live in a universe where the amount of data we try to gather is sort of cabined, right? And I guess that's maybe the big question, is like, can you do that in a way where uh, you make that happen without it kind of crossing that threshold? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Hmm. 